is about to flow, man. He knows what I see Litecoin accelerating. So we're bullish on Bitcoin. Yeah, man. Get this party started. That's it. That's it. Oh, I love it. Thank you, folks, so much. I am Big Chet. I am a cryptocurrency trader. I'm a classical charting trader, Japanese candlesticks. Um, probably most well known uh, from Twitter, where it can be found at Big Cheds. I'm a founding analyst at Bitcoin Live. I love what I do. I focus on the price action. Um, I'm also uh, pretty well known as a newbie helper. So I like to help people getting started out. Uh, I have a blog, chedstrading.blogspot.com. I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, this is going to be a great show. We're going to we're going to look at crypto. We'll look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, some of the major alts. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, altcoins as well. So even start out right now, put in your altcoin requests. We'll get to those, try to get to those throughout the show. Um, but I think the biggest treat is our guest. We have the wolf of all streets, one of my favorite traders, one of my favorite content creators in the cryptocurrency space, Scott Melker. Um, he's going to be joining us kind of in the middle of the show. So I was just uh, really happy to have him. Um, if you're new, hit that like button. We're going to do uh, a little bit of technicals. We're going to talk about the trading psychology and some of that risk management as well. So uh, let's just jump right in and we'll start looking at the Bitcoin chart. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. The fine folks at Benzinga in the control booth will go ahead and get the chart up uh, for everybody and get the party started. So here in the daily chart, it is Monday. Uh, it is uh, the 29th of March, 2021. So we just did finish the weekly candle. Uh, we'll start out with that weekly candle. We'll kind of work our way in. So we have a really nice and clean uptrend. Um, you know, I would recommend you going back and watching the video from last week. We talked a little bit about moving averages. Uh, I'm using kind of a, a few different moving averages here. My short term, what I like to think of as my primary uptrend support, the green line, the 8 EMA. It's an exponential moving average. And what that means is it's a little bit more sensitive to the price uh, than a simple moving average. Uh, and 8 EMA is going to give more weighting to that most recent candle than, than the one eight candles ago versus, uh, for example, a very common one would be the brown line here, the 20 period simple moving average. It's also the uh, middle Bollinger Band as well. So on the weekly chart, we've seen a very nice period of price acceleration really ever since we broke up, um, really kind of uh, broke up over that that uh, like 10, 12K area. We started to accelerate. We got a little bit of air above the upper Bollinger. We pulled back to our moving average support and we kind of did this and churned nicely. Um, so we've been kind of continuing along in that pattern, a kind of in, in that type of a consolidation. Uh, so here we are now. Uh, and one thing I want to note is we're getting, the, the corrections are getting a little bit more shallow. So back here, uh, back January 4th, I think we had about a 32% uh, about a 32% correction from the top of that move uh, down to the bottom. And then uh, we accelerated again. We kind of recaptured that level, uh, theoretically turned that into support at 42. We really actually haven't tested it yet, came close to testing it. But on that next peak uh, where we put in a little bit of that tweezer top with these two candles with a similar upper shadow, and we had about, I believe, a 27, 26% pullback. All right. And then you can say, all right, what's next? Uh, did we bounce again? Because in the weekly chart, once again, we had a kind of an overextension of the price above the upper Bollinger Band. And we pulled back to that 8 EMA. 8 EMA. I think that was about 18%. Uh, just off the top of my head, let's take a look at that. So we're looking at about 18%. So those corrections are getting a little bit more shallow. We're, I think we're leading towards a, a pretty explosive move uh soon you know i'm not one of those people who just comes out and tells you the price is going to the moon um I, I i don't predict the price i pay attention to what the price is telling me now it's telling me that we're in an uptrend uptrends uh trends in general tend to continue uh until they're kind of met with force and you kind of reestablish that supply demand scenario and right now there's not enough not enough supply to meet the demand um every day bitcoin's being taken out of active supply so you have kind of uh, more pressure on supply, gives it a little natural natural upward force. And really that's driving the price up among other things. So weekly chart is beautiful. We have the eight EMA, the RSI is cooling off a little bit. I'm interested to see if this RSI can stay in the power zone. Cause if you look at what's happened 
Uh, we talked about that acceleration out of that 10, 11, 12K range. And the price shot from that 12K range uh, to, you know, 42K. So that's a you know very rather large price movement. Uh, I don't know the exact amount, but it's a pretty big, you know, 250% or, you know, roughly speaking. And that got the weekly RSI. I don't know if you remember, weekly RSI was 95. So a couple of things. An over overbought, you know, or a hot RSI, that's not a reason to sell. You never want your, your technical indicators to be the reason for you to initiate a trade, but you want them to confirm the trade idea. And the only way to get to weekly RSI, you know, not just 95, but weekly RSI over 70 is you have to be bullish. So when your RSI is above 70, it's bullish. It's not bearish. It's not telling you to sell. It's that you're almost uh, recognizing the condition uh, of it being bullish. So we had that condition, the weekly RSI, uh, it got all the way up to 95 and the price kind of cooled off for a bit uh, at that point. Pulled back, it's consolidated and the price has regained, it's kept its gains. And that's where you get that kind of hidden divergence when you get those lower lows in the RSI and you, and you continue to keep your price gains vis-a-vis -vis higher lows in the price. So weekly chart is gorgeous. We have these spinning tops that shows a little bit of indecision and consolidation, but we're respecting eight EMA. You know, that's beautiful. And one thing we will note is uh, we talked about it last week is the MA50, the 50 period moving average, 50 period moving average on the daily chart. We saw it, it, it tagged it, it tested it back in January. And then we had, we had all this time uh, we had all this time in between when the 50 period was tested, 59 days more or less. And a general rule, you know, in this type of a of a strong trend, really kind of any trend, I could hit this uh, inverted. I hit that alt I, I invert it. So th the point is, the first time you retest that kind of long-term moving average, you're almost definitely going to bounce off of it. In this case, you would have faded that mean reversion to the MA50. Uh, in this case, uh, it was a high probability risk war reward type of situation amidst that kind of panic in the market uh, the other day and that brief drop, you know, to that daily MA50 and the weekly EMA8. Um, let's just jump around a little bit more, uh, not just Bitcoin, uh, but just before I go on Bitcoin, I will uh, kind of indicate that I'm watching kind of a key short-term level, level, the high of that January, I'm sorry, a March 24th candle. That is that lower high. Right, so we often often talk about kind of a two level filter, uh, where you get kind of the initial diagonal break, and then you want to look for that horizontal, the higher low break. So I think uh, bulls have a good amount of momentum, especially over fifty seven three. So kind of keeping that that eye in that just uh, short term level. Taking a look at Ethereum, we do see the tightening range uh, on Ethereum, where we have the clearly have the high. And we have the, you know, the lower high structure. And it looks like the price is preparing to test kind of the top of that range. So we have the rising demand uh, kind of with that February 26 low. And then we have the lows of, of March about a month later. You got the key horizontal supply level. We talked about that as well. So Ethereum, you know, from our last video, we're really just still consolidating within this tightening range. Uh, I wouldn't really say with high conviction exactly when it's going to break out, but I would definitely still favor bulls uh, in Ethereum. And you'd want to see a clearing of the, really that 1950 level to give you a little bit more confidence. Uh, let's check out Litecoin uh, real quick. We have about 10 minutes until our guest, uh, 10, 15 minutes to our guest, Mr. Scott Melker, the Wolf of All Streets, uh, will be joining us. And taking a look at Litecoin, uh, we see that set uh, same type of a, um, a, a tightening range uh, set up, but I will note, uh, observe the price on the wrong side of the MA50, the orange line. And so you can kind of look at, think of this as what's called a pullback or a bearish retest of a broken support. Um, you know, Litecoin, the way it's trading right now, uh, not just with the MA50, but with kind of the high of today's session and that high of the 24th, you're kind of setting yourself up for a nice level to initiate a trade. Kind of, you can kind of recapture. I talk a lot about getting clean chart signals. If you can potentially recapture that, that level, your thesis, your bullish trade idea would be I'm getting the MA50. I'm recapturing this kind of short term uh, resistance or supply area. And so that's something you want to look for for kind of a key flip for Litecoin. Uh, Muni has been bullish. Uh, I talk about looking for relative strength when kind of the whole market 
it's pulling back. You want to look for alts that have been bullish and try to play those. And something like uni is going to have your best uh, bet. We talked about dot as well. Uh, this is the same type of thing with the moving average, a 50 period. So it's a really strong uptrend. It accelerate, you know, you see it moving the, using the MA20, the middle Bollinger for support. Uh, it breaks up. We have a nice sideways kind of a, you know, bull rectangle. I bet people, everybody, a lot of people were looking for head and shoulders pattern here, which is one thing you don't want to do is start to draw these things too soon, right? Let the price tell you. And the price made a high, it accelerated, it came back, hit that throwback, the bullish retest and continued. But it, at that point, we have all this air to the MA50. And then we come back and we catch that long-term moving average. So we see kind of a nice example of identifying a nice buy the dip level in an uptrend. I think we see that going on uh, for sure with uni. I just want to remind you, of course, you can find me. I am on Twitter uh, at Big Sheds. Continuing on, we have dot dot in the tightening range. Um, so initially, uh, you know, you have you know what, what could reasonably seen as a, a symmetrical triangle, a bull pennant, you know, a tr uh, triangle after an advance. We're seeing the initial breakdown of that, and now kind of testing uh, this rising uh, rising demand from the underside. So link uh, appears to be weakening a little bit. Sorry, dot rather appears to be weakening here, weakening here just a bit. Uh, so we're seeing an interesting shift in what I had seen to be what I what had be, been some of the strongest uh, USD uh, type of pairs. So it's interesting to see dot a little bit weaker there. Um, I think this is a good time for our uh, lesson of the day. So lesson of the day, um, trading psychology. And so when you're just starting, you know, you got to get to go easy on yourself, right? It's, it's really easy to make mistakes and it's really easy to get down on yourself after a big loss. But, you know, if you're, if you're new to the game, there's no way really to know what's right or wrong. And if you get down on yourself after every loss, you're going to have no momentum. You're never going to build up any confidence. You're not, it probably won't even bother trying to dissect those losses and try to figure out what, what went wrong. So don't get down on yourself. Think about all those bad trades. Think about all those mistakes as an investment. You know, think about, about them as an investment in yourself, in your trading future, and pay attention to what went wrong. You know, don't just throw them away. Don't say, oh, the trade failed. You know, I'm just moving on. No, you paid for that lesson. And, you know, take the time to learn from it, you know, but, but give yourself the time, give yourself the time to learn uh, and the time to grow. So, you know, I, I would say the lesson, uh, one lesson, one of many, an important lesson uh, is to go easy on yourself. Uh, maybe I'll take a look at some chat requests, some uh, chart requests from the chat room to see if there's anything uh, people want to see. LTCN, let's see, BIGG. I'm just kind of taking a look at the chat room here. BIGG. I'm not quite sure what that one is. We'll pull it up there. Big digital asset. Sure. Uh, I don't know if this is exactly the one you're looking for. Uh, big tree group. But uh, we'll kind of take a little peek at that one for you, the big tree group. Not too much volume here. This is very thinly traded. You do want to be careful uh, with these OTC tickers. So, uh, you know, not too much to say about that. I do see another one from the chat room, chat room rather, ARKK, the ARK Innovation ETF. This is an interesting one, not exactly cryptocurrency related. Um, but so what we have here is, you know, we talked about the 200 moving average. So anytime you have the 200 moving average rising, uh, that means you are in an uptrend. And we have the price now uh, after a period, uh, after a period of, strong uptrend after a period of a strong price gains you have really that initial uh, initial kind of diagonal breaks you see that initial weakening uh, initial weakening of the trend and then you see these key horizontal levels that were established you know kind of on the way up right and you see that those were initially broken those are turned into resistance and now you see the 200 moving average so it's actually a decent setup. I've been keeping an eye on this. You do see these prior highs as well, uh, where the price had to pause uh, and consolidate back, you know, back in October and November. So in this situation, you have uh, the price pulling back to, you know, a, a logical level. 
court, you know, bullish confluence, if you will, because you have the rising 200, 200 moving average. Uh, you have the kind of a double bottom, a theoretical a double bottom at the MA200 and those prior horizontals. Um, the OBV is show, confirming the weakness. I'm not really seeing any kind of strength to get me too interested, but I would definitely start looking uh, maybe around that MA200. Um, all right, if we have some other requests here, Hive, okay. Let's see what that one is, Hive. Hive blockchain, okay. Uh, on the TS, if this is the right one, hopefully it is for you. You know, to me, it kind of, you know, my first glance would be, you know, bull flag that's run a little long. So you you really just have a falling channel. So could, because what you want is you really would have wanted this to be the initial flag pull here. And then you want to break out maybe by like, the you know, the 5th of March or something at that point. You don't want this uh, to go on too long. So you really have a falling channel. You have a falling channel. At this point, you're starting to look at your horizontals those those key prior levels we see those starting to come into play you see the price now once now twice respecting that that's a buy the dip zone uh, on hive blockchain uh, if you're in that one for sure and let's see what else here uh i have a couple more alls a couple more alls to talk about uh, and we have our our guest coming uh mr scott melker uh just you can find him he is on twitter at scott melker he is the Wolf of All Streets. He's unbelievably hardworking. He has the Wolf uh, of All Streets podcast. Uh, he's got a newsletter. I see him pretty much all over the place. Uh, the guy's amazing. So I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to, uh, you know, having him here in just a few minutes. All right, Chad. Look like we got a super sticker from Gash Boy checking one check Juan. W-A-N. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Juan. Sure, let's do it. Uh, w and is that a crypto, I believe, right? Yeah. One chain, all right. Let's check out one chain. So, we're at a buck 77 right now. Uh, let's pull up the daily chart. It's a very nice session today, obviously. Uh, you see, continually making those new highs, and we have uh, really just really just today, like I said, breaching that March 16th and 17th high. It might be hard to really close and kind of maintain above kind of that nut or that ideal level. Right at one six seven, uh, I think more than likely you probably want to target a more conservative level, kind of in the middle of that move where you have kind of uh, these initial highs. So I'd look to see maybe that holding and the eight EMA, but this is bullish. Uh, everything about this is strong. Uh, this is a really nice chart. There's there's a bunch of these out there. So one looks nice. I was going to mention hot. It's kind of doing the same thing. HOT USD. It's worth like a penny, a penny, 0.3. And it's just another example of uh, using moving average support on the way up, in this case, the MA20, um, and establishing these nice uh, support levels to look for on the way back. So in something like this, you know, if the price were to dip, you've got clearly identified levels you know, that you want to buy on the way back down. So there's, it's kind of a nice alt climate right now. Hot is really strong. Um, Filecoin is one uh, that a lot of people have been talking about. Uh, it had that really initially really high launch. It came all the way down. It based for a while, and this was interesting. You could you could go back and you know we talk about wanting to have clear levels on the chart identified, and this one gave us that level right around twenty six dollars. Um, after the price kind of initially bottomed and it tried to bounce, you, you you could see where the price is rejected. So really, especially on that second time around where the price was rejected, really kind of confirming, uh, you know, kind of confirming that supply level right around that $25, $26 range, price came back down, continued to base. Now you have a third time. So now you're really paying attention. You get that one, two, three, those three contact points. You know, this was an interesting one. So you could really pay attention to the next time around three days later where you're accelerating and you're starting to test these levels. You're starting to get excited on the break of that 25.7. And you're looking over here, the high of that candle at like 26, one, two or whatnot. So you had, you really had a pretty nice little clear, uh, you know, trading thesis, a trading idea or reason to enter that trade. And since then, this thing has just been unbelievable. Um, you know, I'm always a pessimist. So I thought, I thought it probably had topped off here. We had a couple initial rejections. It came back, 
um and you know you, you could draw you know some type of very general like a triangle or a tightening range where it failed you know and pulled back and didn't hold these initial loads so i was a little more skeptical that, that there would be a continuation uh, we end up getting continuation it, it kind of continued to consolidate we get that diagonal break you can see where like we talked about before where the price was initially rejected it kind of regained that level uh, and just continued on from here and from there and it's just been pretty outstanding uh, eight ema so you want to you want to find things that are in a steady trend and using clear moving average support uh we see that that phil was definitely doing that another one that's been strong is luna um a friend actually mentioned this to me below a dollar and i didn't do anything with it uh i guess i'm an idiot but uh it's been fun to watch because i really started to watch it around a dollar started tweeting about it around a couple bucks and it's just continued on we had this nice kind of you know bull flag i guess uh even like a broadening top that just had a bull break nice acceleration continued consolidation that real nice sideways uh type of move you know, and this is something to think about. Uh, a general rule of charting and classical charting is kind of the longer you stay in a trading range, uh, the more significant uh, the break of that trading range is. So this is a good example of that, a good opportunity to talk about that. Uh, so it's in this tight trading range. We're waiting. We're waiting. We see these Bollinger Bands starting to get tight. And then we get the Bollinger Band pinch. And the price broke out and continued on. Uh, we haven't we haven't gotten a chance to kind of buy here on a throwback or a bullish retest, uh, unfortunately. But uh, maybe we'll get that that opportunity at some point down the road. But this is bullish, and in this case, you get that first MA twenty, you get that first MA twenty test in a while. You know, so I may not be not be in many of these or or all of them, but I kind of know which ones are bullish when I'm trading. And, and that way, when there's these big market wide pullbacks, I'm kind of thinking about where I want to target my money. Um, you know, and that's that's essentially when people talk about relative strength. Uh, we have our guests coming up here shortly. Uh, let me just check one thing. And we're about to bring you on. All right. Excellent. So uh, do we have our uh, guest here? If we do, I'm super excited. Uh, if he's not, I'll just tell you a little bit more. He's one of the hardest working guys in crypto. Scott Melker, Wolf of All Streets podcast. I've just seen his account blowing up. Uh, he's been growing quite fast. So I'm very happy to have him. And he should be here shortly, I believe. Am I right? Oh, my goodness. There he is. That was dramatic. Oh man, trader talk! It was like some porn music. It was cool. Yeah, actually, it was. Like that. that was that was from a cut. I did some work back in the day, so I just I just cut it out the music and all that. I love it. I love it. What's up, man? It's How weird are you today? Being on the other being on the other side from you since I've interviewed you so many times. I feel like. Yeah, man, the other side. I love what you do. Uh, if you don't know Scott, check him out. Check him out. I did show your links, uh, you know, earlier. This is really informal. Uh, it's a new thing. But when I thought about bringing on guests, you're obviously one of the first people I thought about. Um, I like the I like the kind of variety of your content, but there's a lot of it. It's clean. You're not really trying to mess with people. So I like what you do. And uh, so, you know, definitely thanks. Glad to have you. And thanks for coming, man. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm going to definitely need to step up my Hugh Hefner Bitcoin kind of uh, robe there with you. I'm feeling kind of kind of underdressed. Well, it's an opportunity with this Zoom thing. It's an opportunity for people to either have like a like a cat a cat mask or like something. That's else, why I need the know? cat mask. Yeah, for sure. So what's good, man? Let's you know how do you feel right now? I know I know crypto has been good to you. I know you um you know you were a DJ. You do a lot of stuff. You've been trading a lot more. I'd love to hear a little bit more about where you are right now with trading and where you think Bitcoin is and kind of just the first thing that pops your mind like in that in that line. Yeah, I mean, to be totally frank, I've traded so much less because the number has gone up so much more, right? And um, I, I think a lot of people I've talked to uh, sort of have the same feeling. The portfolio sort of naturally grew to uh, a size that was larger than expected and trading became sort of pro prohibitive like or not worth it to some degree. So I, I can't even tell you the last time that I did more than just buy dips on Bitcoin, which I generally do spot at this point. But I haven't touched a leverage trade in months. Uh, and generally, you know, I focus on some alts here and there. But I feel like 
myself, I know a lot of people, we just experienced like three years of absolute misery, but which in retrospect was an opportunity to accumulate tons of coins. And that's what I did. And I'm sort of just reaping the benefits. I, I'm a firm believer in not over trading, definitely. And in trade, you know, <laughs> the less trades you take, the more money you make, the irony, but I think you probably can, uh, can definitely vibe with that. And so honestly, man, I'm just mega, mega, mega bullish on Bitcoin. I think we're nowhere near done with this move. I think we're in the early innings. And so it's almost like I just don't want to trade it away. I just want to sit here and enjoy it. You know, are you surprised? Are you surprised we've been, been this strong, like post 20K? You know, because it's, it's for me, it's like the paradigm shift. It's everything before 20K. And, you know, I expected a rejection, maybe cup and handle to 16 or something, you know. Um, yeah. are, are you surprised how things have unfolded? Yeah. I mean, I would love to say that I'm not because at this point it's very easy to have that sort of hindsight is 2020 uh, vibe. But if you take yourself back to the feeling of almost a year ago, two weeks ago to March 12th, when the market crashed, I certainly couldn't uh, confidently say, Hey, we'll be sitting consolidating in the 50 thousands a year from now, you know? Um, I always believed in Bitcoin. I never really lost my conviction. But if we're talking specifically about price and the way it's behaved, I think it's been uh, certainly a surprise, um, you know, a positive surprise. But if you really dig into the narratives, I was always a technical trader, you know, but I've really kind of switched into the fundamental narratives that are so strong about Bitcoin now. Um, every day it's a new announcement, a new bank, a new institution. You know, I think that very soon we'll see an ETF, which I think will bring pensions and endowments. I think we're going to see central banks putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. So I really think all the things we sort of talked about and everyone said we were crazy, it's all happening now and still very early. And I say this quite often, but I think in my whole life of looking at markets, I'm in my 40s. I'm I'm far from an expert, but just, you know, I've always been at least superficially interested. I don't think I've ever seen a time where retail actually has the ability to completely front run huge money. I mean, we had an opportunity a few weeks ago where Michael Saylor literally said, I'm going to raise a senior convertible note for $1 billion to buy Bitcoin. And you had a week to buy Bitcoin ahead of him buying a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, Right. And so I think that we're going to see that kind of thing across the board. I mean, we know they're coming. Morgan Stanley just opened trading to their wealthy or just opened, you know, Bitcoin access to their wealthy clients above two million. We're going to see JP Morgan follow. We're going to see Goldman. We saw Fidelity file for an ETF. We saw BNY Mellon say that, which is the largest custodian in the entire world, saying they're going to custody crypto. I mean, they're literally telegraphing the largest bull market potentially in history. And all we have to do is just buy with what we can and be patient. So that's really interesting. Yeah. People talked about this being the first time that retail dumps on institutions and uh, the whole power of the people, you know, trader movement, you know, the way you talk about it, it seems like it almost seems like it's a sure bet, but so, but what could derail that, you know, cause we still, on the other hand, we get these weird news headlines that so-and-so says the U.S. will ban Bitcoin. I'm like, what does that mean? You know, so what could yeah. what could derail it? You know, I, th I think regulation is the obvious answer there and that governments. I shouldn't even say regulation because it's inevitable and there's and it can be good in certain manners, especially if big money is coming in. But I think dumb regulation, you know, like uh, thoughtless regulation from people who don't understand it. But I think now um, with the new administration, and I'm not saying Biden versus Trump. I'm saying the people in power. Brian Brooks, I think, was a proponent for for Bitcoin. But now we have Gary Gensler, who literally, like, you know, was a professor on blockchain, huge proponent. We have, you know, uh, Hester Peirce and uh, one of the SEC commissioners. I think we have a lot of a lot going for us. We have senators admitting that they own Bitcoin. So, first of all. It's my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think a person like Michael Saylor or Jack or, or Elon Musk or any of the corporations that are looking at this, I don't think that they just blindly buy Bitcoin without having some inside information or insight as to what's going to happen with regulation, right? They don't bet the future of their entire company if they really believe there's a chance that it will be banned per se. And I don't think it's in the best interest of regulators to ban Bitcoin certainly in the United States, I think it's their, in their interest to collect as much revenue and tax from it and to quote unquote, protect the little guy, which never happens. So that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, more than likely they'll try to make it 
you know, uh, part of the system and then tax it, if anything. Yeah. Um, you know, dumb regulation, shotgun regulation, you know, um, without forethought. But in terms of if, you know, did those people uh, put in their homework ahead of time, there has to be some inherent risk. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the upside, right? So is there, would you not also just have to concede their, maybe they just oh. have it wrong, you know? And It's definitely possible. There's always inherent risk. But I think that uh, Bitcoin has proved its resilience. I think the whole it's going to zero, it's going away narrative is completely dead, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that means price has to go up, but I, Bitcoin's here to stay. Right. This is going to become a mature asset class. I think that it's going to be on the radar uh, unless something cataclysmic happens. I can't really, you know, identify in my mind what that would be. But I really I just don't I don't see it now. Like I said, that doesn't mean price has to go up. It could last. It could be here forever and it could be 10K stable coin. Right. <laughs> so yeah. um, anything is possible. I just think that um, this is one of those rare opportunities where so many things are lining up in its favor. So what would you, I mean, you're a seasoned trader and you've got probably a lot of things going on, but if you're someone who's new and maybe has, a, has a more money in Bitcoin than they expected to have, what would you recommend to them? You know, if they're a little bit nervous about it, you know, they think it's going hundred K, but it's moved so much, you know, what would you say to them? Yeah. I mean, if you're nervous about an investment, you should be selling some, uh, regardless, regardless of your belief in it. And I know that that sounds absurd and nobody wants to hear that. But you have to be comfortable uh, in your investment. Or you're going to make bad emotional decisions. You and I have both pointed out on countless occasions that as hard as it is to sell, the minute you sell, you take pressure off yourself, right? Yeah. Listen, I'm not selling Bitcoin. I have no interest in selling Bitcoin. I trade all coins. I sell all coins all the time. I take profit across the board at this point. I personally view Bitcoin as more of a, like an index fund that I'm saving for my retirement or my children's future. You know, I really have that sort of, I think conviction in it, but if you, you know, if you're way overexposed at this point, like if you're not paying your bills so that you can hold Bitcoin, that's not generally a wise financial decision. So it's all very personal. Everyone's situation is different. Everyone, you know, it depends on your age, your conviction, your risk tolerance, how much money you have, what percentage it is. So it's very hard to answer that for any individual, but I can just say like, you don't have to make binary decisions. You just, you don't, I'm uncomfortable. I'm selling it all. That's stupid, right? Yeah. Sell a little. Sell a little. Like I don't have enough. I'm buying. I'm using all my money to buy more. That's stupid, right? Dollar cost average in and and be be smart and take the pressure off your your decisions. But if you're getting emotional and losing sleep over it, then you're overexposed. So what helped you though? I mean, like you you we went through that and we've had our, our own kind of yeah, <laughs> losing so much money on so many occasions. Are there any so things that times. stick out? Are there any kind of things that really stick out? And you don't have to share too much, but that kind uh, of... I'll, I'll share. In 2012, I think 12 or 11, I had a trade on a, on a I was going to say a coin. That's how fix it, where my mind is at. But it was on a stunk, as people like to call it, called Eric's Therapeutics. Eric's Pharmaceutical, Eric Therapeutics. A friend of a friend was a consultant, and they were going to get FDA approval on their new blood thinning drug that was going to change the world. I put every spare penny I had into this stock, it was six bucks. Um, within a week, the CEO got on a quarterly earnings call and made some dumbass comment about, uh, yeah, everything's going along well, but we're like running out of money <laughs> and something. And I literally wrote it to zero, like to a delisting from the stock market. Mm. Right. And I cashed out when it was pennies. Like I, you know, I took like, hundred dollars out of a multiple five figure at the time, huge for me, you know, investment. And I didn't touch markets for a very long time from there. Besides like my, you know, my retirement fund, uh, auto averaging into spy or whatever SPY. I just, you know, it, it wrecked me. And, but, uh, when I came back, I think having, in, in fact, I think it's probably the best experience I've ever had in retrospect as a trader, because at some point you just really say, I'm not, I don't want to lose money anymore, man. This is brutal. <laughs> yeah, but how did you so, do it? Did you learn TA? Did you... Um... I, I, I knew some TA already. And I think I just tightened up my risk management. I think, you know, I learned the power of a stop loss, but even more importantly than the stop loss, the power of position sizing. Mm. 
just like not being overexposed, betting less than I thought I needed to, not planning for the house or Lamborghini I was going to buy, but planning for what was going to happen if I lose, you know, sort of planning my losses as, as opposed to planning my wins, I think was a huge mental thing. And I think just after, you know, slowly gaining success over the years after I came back, I slowly just, uh, you know, desensitized myself to losses. And I think that was really the key is, you know, like I get more pissed off if like I lose a fantasy football game than I do if I lose mm. a trade, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. For some reason, I can now utterly detach emotions from my trading, which is interesting because I'm very emotional about Bitcoin. I'm just yep. not emotional about the trades on Bitcoin or the things around it. It's a, you're a system. You're a systems trader. You probably have a a pattern and a feel. And with like sports, it's it's not your if it the guy drops a pass, it's not your fault. You should just say, eh, it happened. You know, luck. You say yeah. bad luck. You know. You'd think, um, but I get really mad. <laughs> I'm I'm, inter I'm interested to hear a little bit more about like uh you know, like projects you're working on because I know you're always doing new stuff. You know what's on the what's on the plot, hot plate right now. You know, man, it all just sort of evolves and I, I don't really have a grand plan. Honestly, people think always say that I think I do, you yeah. know, like I was a DJ and I just, so I had a following and I had the blue check and I had my face. And so maybe those are assets because, you know, a lot of people obviously don't do that in this space. And I, one day I just started talking about crypto and everybody unfollowed me who liked me for music, but then <laughs> built a new following there. And then honestly, it was like, Twitter is not enough. I, I can't say what I want to say on Twitter, these long threads. So I was like, I'm going to start a free newsletter and just put it out and see how it goes. And I became really passionate about doing that. So I, it became a daily thing. And then I just started, I still have a free version, but I started charging 15 bucks a month because it was like, if I want this to be my job, obviously, you know, there needs to be comp some compensation. So I had the newsletter and then the guys from Blockworks came to me and were like, Hey man, you know, you should do a podcast. I was like, what the hell is a podcast? I've never listened to a podcast in my life. I literally did my first five podcasts or something before I'd ever listened to one, just showed up and had conversation with people. And then I don't know. Then I was like, the podcast is only two times a week and they come out like weeks after. I want to do stuff that's right now. So I started a YouTube channel, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and which honestly the YouTube channel is like, um, it's an expense. I'm not, I don't have any, like, nobody's paying me. I'm like paying a guy to do videos every day and stuff. I just do it because I love it. You know, so I think my approach in general is that I just want to have fun and I'm having fun doing it for now. And if I stop having fun, I won't, but there's no next plan from here. Mm. You know, I'm mm. just like investing in what I can invest in. I'm riding the wave. Maybe, you know, I'll find some sponsors for YouTube or something and I can grow it more, you know, when I have that justification. But honestly, man, I, I'm having a great time. Like, wow, no plan, man. man. That, that was one of my questions. I had to cross it off. You know, if you got, I like that you're living in the moment and you're building what's in front of you without really worrying where, where it's going to go. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the context of that is that like I'm now in a financial situation where I can do that which is a like not a place I was in most of my life. Certainly as a DJ, you make a ton of money for three months and then it would just be abysmal for three months. Kind of like trading, mm. actually. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like you could never count on anything for the future. And there was always sort of an expiration date to my career, I felt like, you know, like I wasn't going to be 60 and DJing, you know, and so having yeah. kids kind of accelerated that. Um, and uh, I don't know, man, like the last year since COVID kicked in as bad as it's been lifestyle wise and as dramatic and stuff. Like I think financially for a lot of people who really had conviction and got their money in, um, they've done very well. It's funny. I had a conversation with Mark Yusko on Friday, which will come out, I think next week on the podcast. And he said, you know, you hear about diversification all the time. You need to diversify and as an investor, you need to diversify. He said diversification is great once you have assets. He was like, mm. concentration is how you like really accumulate wealth and get rich. He's like, but you have to concentrate on the right thing. It's like, so 90% yeah. of people go broke with concentration, but the 10% or whatever who make it, that you get all this money and then you diversify, right? That's right. That's um, how you stay, that's how you stay, you know, rich or whatever. Yeah. Diversification is not for getting rich. Diversification no, no. is for staying rich. You know, well, and I theory, think that that's though, an important. In theory, though, you have that that uh, diversified basket of risky assets, right? Like the people invest in a hundred companies, and the one of those will pay for all of them in theory. But you, you got to hit That's one. How we or approach all coins, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, and so I think that um, 
I was more concerned, you know, two years ago, whatever, when I was doing all this, maybe I was a little more concerned about like how I would pay for all this if I wanted to have fun. And then it got to a point where it's like, I can just kind of have fun and hopefully the money will come. And I, it's funny because it tends to come when you're not uh, working, when you're not uh, consumed with the idea of it coming, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't, I, there is no grand plan. I don't know what I want to be. I can actually tell you that the more everything grows, the more hesitant I am about it, not the more excited. I think that uh, Twitter is a very difficult place when you get to a certain level of following. Um, and it becomes less enjoyable, which is, which kind of uh, surprised me, but the community becomes too large. There's, you can't interact with anyone. And obviously, even if it's only like 2% negativity, when you have 30,000 followers, 2% negativity is fine. When you have 270,000 followers, it's just like people are screaming in your face all the time. Yeah. So I've, I, I, I can empathize. I understand that. How do you, um, not, not get caught off guard? So, you know, sometimes you get caught off guard with a comment. You maybe oh, you don't, understand. how do you, how do you? avoid that how do you deal with it i have a policy of non-responsiveness like just go high you know and and i sort of believe that like if something is below you you don't engage with it because you're bringing yourself down to that level i was not always that way so like i mm. used to engage in it and whatever but at this point it's like that's just i just want to be happy i want positivity so like embracing that negativity or paying attention to it or giving it lip service i think it just like sort of compounds it so it's sort of like you just got to let it go. It's very hard. Listen, I don't care at all if someone like comments negatively in my stuff. What I hate, honestly, and I'm going to be honest, like being called a scammer or like being accused of being paid for something that I'm literally not being paid for. Or something like is, That's the thing. You get to a point where in this community, you can't. I can't even post a chart that I just like happened to pass by without someone accusing me of like being paid. And, and sometimes those are huge accounts, you know, and it gets a lot of engagement, whatever. So listen, I'm not, yeah, I'm not even trying to complain. I love Twitter. It's whatever. It just becomes a platform where like at a certain point, all you can do is just tweet and then almost ignore, <laughs> it's like, it. pull the pin, throw the grenade and walk out of the room, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. and, uh, and that's not nearly as fun when I had, you know, 30,000 followers, I would respond to every single comment. I loved it. You know, like I would get into, I would engage with people. I would debate people. I would, and now it's just like, You'll notice like every time somebody gets bigger, their account, like all of a sudden, like becomes less controversial and more like inspirational. <laughs> like, like everybody becomes Tony Robbins. It's just because it's honestly like it's not purposeful. It just becomes easier. That's what I want to ask like, you about. I put out a tweet I, and and thanks for, for sharing about that. And I put out a tweet at that uh, this new brand of cheerleaders is a little bit annoying. And I see a lot of them. It's just every tweet is, you know, a 5K price target for Ethereum and you know, Bitcoin's going to change your, your life and change your shoes and everything. And, um, you know, it's like you, people who haven't been in through a bear market. They don't know what it's like. Like Bitcoin will rip your heart out and then they'll give you a new one. I mean, you got to kind of, yeah. uh, so I just, I'm a little bit, the new brand of that, the pumpers, I mean, do you, do you hear me on that or what are your thoughts on that? Kind of I, thing? I, I, I do. I mean, maybe I like, I, I don't know, you know, like maybe, maybe they're not doing it on purpose and it's just like, how they talk. I don't know. I, I would hate to think that it's like they're trying to like scam anyone out of their money or anything like that. I don't know. But yes, I think, like I said, the, it becomes very watered down. And I'm going to be honest. I think a lot of these people who are doing that got really, really rich in the past few months and don't know even how to act. Yes. I've seen it. So, dude, I've seen it so many times. I've had so many people talk to me, like, especially in like December, January, when it really like things got revving and people who are invested in like smaller DeFi coins, they like did for starting pull 1500 X's. Like everybody became like this waxing poetic poet, like, yeah. Oh, I've got all the money in the world, but it didn't bring me happiness. And you know, like I bought a car and it didn't bring me happiness. Now you're seeing the McLarens and the watches and the whatever. Yep. So I, honestly, I think it's a lot of young people who got money. It didn't necessarily make them happy immediately. And now they're just like firing shit off. I don't know. It's just a theory, but, um, I don't know if it's a new brand. I think that just people got a lot, like a lot more people got a lot more money and got a lot more followers. I, I really what, think that's it's what happens. Like, yeah. There's so many, like you can see like how fast the followers start coming in when the market turns bullish. And it's like, you got to speak to these newbies. So what are you going to say? Like, you gonna start talking about like complex candlestick patterns. You're just going to tell them that your price target for Bitcoin is a million dollars. You know, I don't know. So I, I think there's a delicate balance 
And I think I'm telling you, man, you get to a point where you're afraid to post certain kinds of things. I won't say afraid because I don't really give a shit, but, but like you think twice before you maybe post what you would have posted when you had 30,000 followers, you know, like I generally, now I'd stay away from politics. I stay away from COVID. I stay like a year ago, I was getting blasted when I would talk. You remember you and I were like on sort of the same, <laughs> same horse, but it just became not worth it. Like it wasn't convincing anyone. I was just bringing myself threats and uh, problems. Yeah, you know? that's interesting. I was thinking about that, thinking about that today. There's a couple couple great trader accounts who I think they don't realize that their politics just they're just all the time talking about stuff and you have to separate it um you know on the other hand the people like you and I and other people we also like to tweet we get it out and if people enjoy it they do they like it if they don't it's cool but it's it's for us too so you know you don't want to police yeah, someone cathartic. else's feed yeah it's cathartic. Yeah. You, you don't want to police someone else's feed I really try to never tell someone hey don't tweet that that's their feed you know well, it's funny as you and I first met because we had a civil discourse about a candlestick pattern, an evening yeah. star, I believe it was, um, because we were kind of uh, debating whether it mattered that there were gaps or not, because in crypto, you don't get the gaps. And in legacy markets, you have the weekend off, so you get gaps, you know, and it was a civil conversation. And we both ended up, what could have been contentious, ended up two dudes following each other and finding mutual respect and coming on each other's shows and talking about stuff. You know what I mean? And that's, dude, I sent a tweet this weekend. I did a video on it, like where I said, Bitcoiners and shitcoiners, you know, it's time to get along. We're all on the same team. Nope. No. <laughs> apparently, apparently that was the like just a simple conciliatory tweet saying, hey, man, you know, none of us want to like feed the bankers. We all want an option to opt out. That's what I was saying. Nope. Everybody, I mean, aggressive, just anger mm. from the biggest accounts across. Like, I'm not talking to them, not them, not the shit. You know, and like, I mean, so it just showed me how far we have to go. I mean, people really just love to fight. You can't, you, they have to though. That's how we have a market. I think about like people get offended if someone disagrees, but if everyone agreed with you, there'd be no market. You know, it just, oh, that, that's for sure. You that's know, for sure. And, um, it's, it's easy to disagree with people when it's just characters, no facial movements and all that. Um, we just have a few more minutes left and I'm really glad you're here. Check out, you know, Scott Melker, all, the, all his work. I see some memorabilia or some baseball, you know, in the background. Are you, and I want to ask you, I know you're still plugged into the music community. How do you feel about NFTs, collectibles, intersection with music and kind of, what do you think about that? So like, I, I, I'm an avid, like the funny thing is like, I don't buy clothes. I don't buy anything, but I, I like, scarce stuff. Like I always had, I was a sneaker guy. I was always a sports memorabilia guy. Like that was the things I would kind of like passionately spend money on. So I think NFTs are exceptionally cool. Um, I think there's a ton of potential in music. All of that said, I think it's in an absolute bubble and some people are just going to get rinsed aggressively and very soon. Right. Like I wrote about this. I like we went from <laughs> like people making fun of NFTs to fully like on Saturday Night Live in like two months. Yeah. Mainstream, you know, right? Too, too fast, too mainstream. The prices are too high. The stuff, you know, and listen, the cream will rise to the top. Beeples are going to be worth money. Trevor Jones, Micah Johnson, like the really good stuff. And I follow all of it, man. I'm very passionate about it. But like red dot and tweets and whatever selling for millions of dollars, that shit's going to be worth nothing. Yeah. In my opinion, so right? you think I, it's going to be worth nothing, and so like it's gonna. And listen, we saw it. Bitcoin bubble popped. It grew again, got better. Right, the people who stuck around were the quality ones who were here for the right reasons. DeFi last summer absolutely had a bubble pop. We were farming yield farming coins that were doing yeah. two thousand APY and rug pulls and foods. And now DeFi is better for it, right? So like it's an inevitability of any market or any like whatever. I just think that that's sort of coming with with uh, NFTs. I love them. I think they're amazing. I think it's just going to be that thing. It's like in uh, 2017 when like that uh, iced tea company or Long Island iced tea like put blockchain in the name. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden oh, their yeah. stock went up like 5,000. I feel like anything yeah. that says NFT now, yeah. like people will just buy it and expect it to go up and like, just because it's an NFT does not give it value. And I think that that's what's being lost here. It is problematic. Um, people will buy anything because it is an NFT, regardless of what it is. It's just stupid, you know? So interesting. So, do you, so uh, it, it will survive, and what's left uh, will be better uh, for the system. And um, uh, it's going to survive, and it's the future of many things. I think it's the future of collectibles, I think it's the future of art. 
Uh, provenance is a huge issue in the real art world, like knowing that something is authentic because even the, some of the most pa famous paintings have been faked and sold because they fake the provenance. They, they burn the, the certificate. They use paper 400 yep. years old to write a false, right? They don't just counterfeit the painting. They counterfeit everything. So at the very basic level, I think that's really compelling, even more so than the art. Obviously, it's the provability of authenticity and the, the tracking of that that the blockchain offers. But I think also like the true purpose of not non-fungible tokens was not art and collectibles initially. And that when I first heard about it three years ago, it got me more excited about it as a future thing and still sort of does is the boring stuff that it can be used for. It, it's the greatest way to eliminate that like third party toll collector intermediary that's in the middle of every single transaction, right? There's no reason that I need a title company or the, you know, the, the tag agency to hold my title. And when I wanna sell my car, that I need to like call them to send me the title, to send someone the whatever, like I should be able to sell my car to you without someone in the middle. I should be able to sell my house to you and transfer a mortgage, all these things with no third party in the middle. I should be able to send money. Like that's why stablecoin, Bitcoin, whatever, amazing without somebody taking their piece or five intermediaries and banks mm -hmm. and all that. And so an NFT, like I, it's one of a kind. It proves this is my car. This is where it's been here, right? I literally send it to you on the blockchain and we're done with that transaction. To me, that kind of thing is way more exciting it eliminates, you know, these, that's the whole point of decentralization, right? I mean, we just want to eliminate these toll collectors that do nothing and take their piece in the middle of every transaction and slow it down. So, so it's so fascinating. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And for me, I just tell myself it's a digital footprint. It's a digital, whatever, you know, uh, skew or whatnot of whatever that is. And then I can understand it, right? I don't have to think too much more. Yeah. Uh, so do you think, uh, but like these things will be recognized in a few years, like the, everything is, it's all, you know, anything is worth what someone else will pay you for it. So uh, you must, are you, you're confident that the system itself will continue to function. You talked about it. The, yeah. Uh, it, I think it's exceptional. I think it's like, I, I think it's gonna, yeah, I think it's gonna be a very impactful thing. And I think that um, a lot of this stuff will do exceptionally well. Like NBA top shot. I like that. I don't really get that. You know, like I love it. I think it's cool, but like a highlight of some dude from a random game on a Tuesday in 2020, yeah. like, okay, right. you know, so maybe that won't have value. I have no idea. And, you know, listen, I traded baseball cards. Like it was, that's where it kind of started for me in like early 80s. And I was like, I used to go to the bookstore and we literally like had Saturday morning, like baseball card trading. That's what got me into trading. Like I was a hustler. And so, like, and I, an amazing story that I'll probably liken to NFTs. A few years ago, my mom was finally like, get this shit out of my house. You know, mm. the classic, like whatever. And yeah. I had like unopened wax packs boxes that I had invested in when I was like a 13 or 14 year old. Mm. They like saved all my money and these were going to be like my retirement. I took like tens of thousands of baseball cards into two different local baseball card stores and they told me they would pay me to leave. Huh? You know, they were like, these are like everything from the 80s was overprinted. It's oversaturated. Literally, like we yeah. wouldn't, these aren't worth the paper they're printed on. And I like took them to a charity and I donated it and like took mm. a small write off because like maybe some kids would like have fun opening baseball cards or something. But I think that, that like, that's similar to where we're at probably with uh, a lot of the NFT stuff over the next few months and years. So the people who are smart and they, they kind of can have a little bit of foresight about what might still have value down the road. A 1952 um, Mickey Mantle tops card is still worth millions of dollars, right? But like a, uh, you know, a Mookie Blaylock 1986 tops is not like really moving the needle. Like a Mookie Wilson was, what, yeah, was what I was going for. But yeah, so yeah, I think it's you know, those I'm really cards interested. I collected. I'm interested to see what it will do for music, you know, because I love art. I love music and, you know, the starving artist. I don't want the artist to be starving. You know, I want everyone to enjoy it. I think art should be appreciated more as a society. Um, life is art, you know, so I'm interested to see NFTs kind of, um, helping these, um, artists maybe retain more control. Is that what I understand helps them kind of retain yeah, I think, control? Yeah. I mean, if you don't have, you know, that sort of has shifted through time where people have moved away from big label record deals and things like that, where they have complete control of your catalog and they own your masters because we have platforms like SoundCloud and all these things where you can post your own music with 
it used to be in the music industry that you literally needed a distributor for people to listen to your music. Like I could make whatever I wanted, but it's not getting on the shelves of Tower Records without Tower Records without a record label. You know, so the internet really revol revolutionized that for music, and people can discover things, Bandcamp, all these platforms. So now you take it to a place where it's like I can sell you like only like ten people can get this song, but I can directly sell you my art, and you can tell me exactly what you think it's worth. You know what I mean? So that's got a lot of potential. Uh, with NFTs or thousands or 10,000, it doesn't matter. I mean, we saw Wu-Tang sell an entire album to Shkreli or whatever, you know, one copy of an entire album and for millions of dollars. Or And I think we'll uh, see more crazy stuff like that with music. Also, like in the context of COVID, which obviously is coming to an end and we're going to see, I'm not saying COVID is coming to an end, but obviously I think concerts are coming back and all of those things. But I think that it's taught artists that they need a lot of uh, streams of revenue and that just touring and playing shows ain't going to cut it if that can be pulled, you know, at any moment. Blau was very far ahead of that, you know, I think, um, and started really kind of the DJ NFT craze. So, uh, you know, but yet again, a lot of it will be worth nothing. We'll see. I mean, I think that we're going to see a lot of innovation, though, continuing with how music is distributed and how people, you know, interact yet again. It's a way for an artist to interact directly with their fan without a third party intermediary. It's more decentralized. I think that's what we all want. I think this is all decentralized and it's interesting to see how crypto's done that. NFTs are going to kind of extend that. The party music is distributed and how people you know interact yet again. It's a way for an artist to interact directly with their fan without a third party intermediary. It's more decentralized. I think that's what we all want. I think this is all decentralized and it's interesting to see how crypto's done that. NFTs are going to kind of extend that, the whole peer to peer the internet. Let's guys like me and you talk. You're in Florida, I'm up in New England, and uh, it brings the world together. And we just kind of share these same moments together. So I think that's really cool. Um, yeah. It's been awesome having you on here, man. Um, Thank you, you so much. What do you want to leave us with? Uh, you know, listen, you said, I mean, yeah. I I, I just think that this is really one of those rare few times in a lifetime moments in Bitcoin. And I don't really think that it's done personally. Like, I think that we really are somewhat early. So I just urge you, if you're going to trade, do it with a very small portion of your portfolio that you're willing to lose, but don't lose everything and then watch this market just absolutely explode because I do believe that it will. Um, as far as finding me, just at Scott Melker on Twitter, and uh, everything else is linked there. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I love having you on, man. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Send me one of those robes. <laughs> you got it, buddy. So we can match next time. I'll get an Ethereum one and we'll really trigger everyone. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks for coming out, man. It was good to have you. Thank you, brother. All right, cool. So I think we just got a couple minutes left. I will say thank you to Benzinga. Uh, for putting this together. Uh, you know, this is episode two. Hopefully we'll keep bringing these episodes to you, bringing some great guests. I am Big Cheds. You can find me on Twitter at Big Cheds. Uh, I'm a founding analyst at Bitcoin Live, the best in class educational platform for crypto. I would uh, encourage you to check that out if you're serious about learning. Um, and, you know, we've I have some great guests in mind, uh, people through Twitter. I want to bring on to people with different perspectives. Uh, so you can learn uh, and really kind of take take control of your future. Uh, and that's what you want to do. You want to feel in control when you're trading because you have a plan. You know, you're not just you're not at the roulette table. You know, you're at the poker table and you understand your position. You understand how much you're risking, why you're risking it. Um, and that's that's how I think about trading. I think about trading with a plan uh, based on like we talked about earlier, buying uptrends and dips. Um you know, Scott Melker talked about uh, scaling in and kind of managing your risk, not doing it all at once. So all those things that will help you out uh, to the next level. So I'll hopefully we'll see you folks next week. Uh, and I'm Big Cheds and we'll talk again soon. All right. And uh, keep on make breads with Cheds. Juice is about to flow, man. He knows what I see Litecoin accelerating. So we're bullish on Bitcoin. Yeah, man. Get this party started.